Many are calling 2020 the year of the pest. So what do you call it? Welcome to the Fervent Four. Did you know that only 4% of businesses ever cross the annual million dollar mark? What's up everyone? I'm Zach Miller, author of Anomaly. With me today, I have my co-host, Tim Ryan, lead man at startwheel.org. Thanks so much for joining us. The Fervent Four is a weekly show every Thursday at 11 a.m. dedicated to sharing insights into growing a world-class business no matter the climate. The Fervent Four is powered by the SBDC, which helps local small businesses grow through counseling and resources like this show. If you're interested in learning more on how the SBDC can help your business, head to startwheel.org slash weekly. Dennis Gray has been cleaning up those pests for decades with his company, Accurate Pest Solutions. So what happens when those pests become even more pesty? Welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Tim. What's happening? Hey, Zach. Well, thank, hey, Dennis. Thanks for having me. I don't know that anyone has actually called this the year of the pest, but I decided to call it the year of the pest. I thought it was appropriate for today with, with, with whatever the nonsense has been going on in 2020. And because you own a pest company, uh, I, I thought it would be great. What do you think, Dennis? Is this the year of the pest? I, I think so. I think, um, you know, Unintentionally, obviously, uh, but you know, due to uh, some unforeseen sources such as COVID, you know, a lot of people are working from home now um, and mandated to work from home. So when you spend more time at home, you notice everything. You notice the bugs that are crawling in the in the kitchen and in the, the bedroom and living room. Um, the wife's bugging you because she's starting to notice bugs. The kids are noticing bugs. They're not at school. They're home. So everyone's uh, pointing out all the issues at home and that, you know, gets our phone ringing off the hook. And we love it when our wives bug us about the pest <laughs> that they're finding around the house. There's nothing like it. I mean, it's it's just so wonderful and convenient. Nothing but love from that comment there. But that's so interesting that you said it like that because it's like when you're not home, right? There's 40 hours plus a week that you're not home. So you don't notice those things as much. But because so many are working from home now, they do notice these things. So, so my first question for you, uh, you, you've owned Accurate for what, over a decade, 15 years? What is it? What's, how long is it? Uh, actually, we've been 18 years here in Virginia now. Wow. 18 years. And congrats. so, yeah, congrats on that. So the, the number one thing is normally when you guys would go and service homes and, and businesses, um, in a business, maybe they were there, but it was okay. But at home, a lot of the times you guys, um, people didn't mind you guys being in there, but now with COVID people freaked out, right? I don't want people in my house. You don't want people in your house. People don't want people in their houses. You know, does this person have it? Do they not? So like just off the surface, like how do you guys, how do you as a business that is in people's safe space, like combat that immediately because I I think that's something that I remember when I talked to you in March about this it was it you know it's it it's a big deal because people you know we're we're terrified of, of of what could happen so how do you handle it? Well, absolutely, Zach, and you know we had to make some some adjustments and we had to make some adjustments quick, quick and fast. Um, you know I've gotten a calls back in March um, in my office. You know, we do two of the largest uh, school districts in this area, uh, Newport News and also uh, the city of Portsmouth. And we got calls that the governor was thinking about shutting down the schools, which means that we couldn't get into the schools to service. And that was going to be a chunk of our revenue loss, at least for a few months. Um, and then we had a lot of our homeowners calling in saying, hey, you know, we have people that are here that have underlining issues and we don't feel comfortable with having the technicians coming into the house. Um, we had to brainstorm very, very quickly and say, hey, how do we continue to maintain our service so that the business doesn't go down the toilet with COVID? Um, so we pivoted and we went to an exterior only service. So instead of having to come inside of the home, um, actually over 80% of your pests, any of your crawling pests, roaches, spiders, ants, they can be addressed from the outside. So we just had to have that conversation with our clients and say, hey, listen, we understand. We get it. We don't want to put you guys at risk for COVID. We don't want our technicians to be at risk for COVID. However, we don't want you to have to deal with a pest issue inside of your home either. 
So let's try this. Let's go to an exterior focus service. What we can do is we don't have to collect any money from you. No money, no, no checks, no credit cards. Um, you, your service will actually be billed through ACH. So we don't have to physically take your money. We'll grab a credit card. We'll process that through ACH. The technician will notify you uh, when he's on the property. You don't have to come to the door. The technician will address your, uh, your situation from the outside. So we're treating the foundation. We're treating your window frames. We're treating your door frames, all of the entry points that these pests would take. And then we're putting an attractant on the outside. So if you have ants, we're putting an attractant on the outside to draw them out. If you have water bugs or roaches, the attractant goes outside to draw those pests on the outside. The clients loved it. They ate it up. Um, and we, we didn't lose any of our residential clients uh, due to COVID. And it really helped out with a lot of our larger government and um, commercial clients putting us on pause. And that's something that you had implemented actually pre-COVID for at least a couple of months. Like, it, I don't think people think of pest control to be something that's innovative, yet you were trying to be innovative, recognizing something like that, right? A absolutely. We actually went to an exterior focus service last quarter of 2019. Um, and this was designed for us to actually perform the service in a, 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 basically a lower amount of time. So it typically would take us 60 minutes, an hour to do the inside and outside. And we're looking to increase revenue. So one way to increase revenue is to free up some of the time that our technicians spent on location. And the way that we came up with that would be to focus on the exterior that cuts our service time down in half. And now we can actually give that technician um, additional clients to service. And in some cases, we were able to double that technician's productivity. Yeah, one thing that I'm curious about, uh, as you talked about your shift to residential, um, how does that impact the, the commercial and the office buildings? I mean, should I would, I would think that you would want to make sure that you pay attention so that when you do open back up that uh, your building and your office space isn't uh, you know, infested with uh, with different pests. Uh, what's your take on that? Absolutely. And, and my, my thoughts are the exact same as yours. However, um, in March and in April, we didn't know enough about COVID and everyone panicked. So the phones rang, the government agencies, the school systems, the cities that we service, our commercial clients, they said, hey, we want to put the brakes on this. We're not dropping the service we just don't want you guys in our building until we figure this thing out. Everyone was trying to figure COVID out. Um, so unfortunately, we went two and in some cases three months where there was a lot of lost revenue because we weren't able to get into those facilities to service our clients. Um, and again, we had to have some conversations here in the office. We had to make some adjustments and some changes. And this basically um, went to how do we communicate to the client that we can do this in a safe way. We need to get into your uh, facility so that when your employees come back, as you said, they aren't coming back to a pest infestation. Um, and that was a series of emails, a series of text messages, and a series of phone calls to convince the um, decision makers to let our guys back in after two or three months and to start servicing these sites so that when the employees came back, they were coming back to a pest-free environment. So how do you combat that? That's gonna be like the word of the day for me, combat. I never use that word, but I'm gonna use it for you today. How do you combat that conversation, that, that, that fear from those agencies? And then the, the fact that it still seems like people still don't know any, any, really anything about COVID, right? So how, you're trying to convince them, hey, we're gonna do this in a safe way it's unclear what a real safe way is. So how do you, how do you present that so that you guys can get in there and not lose, you know, additional revenue throughout the whole process? So a couple of ways, the first way, let them know you care. You know, that's, that's the, the main thing. Hey, listen, we get it. We understand that you want to be safe. You want a safe environment for your employees. And we, we care about that. We hear you. So our, our technicians, when they're on site, they're going to be in full PPE. They're going to have their respirator on. They're going to have their gloves on. We're going to sanitize 
our equipment before we bring it into that environment. And we're going to sanitize our vehicles. We're going to sanitize our office. We're taking all the necessary steps. As our technicians come into work, if they have a temperature, if they have signs of COVID, they have any of the symptoms, we're sending them back home. We're not going to send a potentially infected uh, technician out to your location. Um, we're not even going to send an asymptomatic technician out to your location. If our technician tests positive for uh, COVID, um, they are quarantined for 14 days. They do not come to work. They're not going to put the rest of our employees at jeopardy, and we're not going to put your staff and your building at jeopardy as well. As you mentioned, every your all your folks are pretty much covered from head to toe to begin with. Did you have to go above and beyond what you normally did as a result of COVID, or uh, what you had in place was that all that was needed? Uh, technically, it was all that was needed, but we wanted to go above and beyond. So we made sure that the technicians had the required respirators. We made sure that the technicians wore the appropriate gloves. Um, and also the sanitizing. Sanitizing wasn't something that we did on a normal basis, but when COVID hit, and again, there wasn't enough information on how it was transmitted, who was affected by COVID. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our technicians and our staff was safe out in the work field. So we made sanitizing daily a part of you know our daily routine as well. All right, let's get into pests. So you, I, I know you grew up wanting to own a pest <laughs> services company. I mean, I, I, that, was, that was like the thing that you grew up. Some people want to be like Troy Aikman or Mickey Mantle or Michael Jordan. Dennis Gray was like, nah, man, I want to <laughs> own a pest <laughs> services business, right? I mean, that, that, that was the dream? Actually, no. I mean, what? I, Come on, man. <laughs> you know, I wanted to do everything under the sun. At one point, I wanted to own a bookstore. At one point, I wanted to be an architect. Um, but I was drawn to entrepreneurship. Um, everything past, you know, my college days, I was drawn to owning a business and being in business ownership. Um, I happened to be in a situation where I worked for a pest control company and I, I fell in love with it fell in love with basically helping people and giving them back uh, just a, a different quality of life. Um, I, I was, if you're into sports and, and you're a Michael Jordan fan and when Michael Jordan would be down uh, five points or six points and there's seconds left on the clock and he ties it up and there's three seconds left and Michael Jordan has the, the ball and he shoots it in as the buzzer rings and he wins for his team, that feeling that he had I got that feeling when I was eliminating pests from people's homes. So at that particular point, I decided to uh, learn everything there was to learn about the pest control business and the company that I worked for, I moved from department to department. So I worked in sales for a number of years. I worked as a technician. I worked in management. I worked in the office. I wanted to learn every aspect of the pest control business at that point. I, I would have put my money on the fact that uh, since you're an adventurous person that, uh, you know, going 160 miles an hour on a motorcycle, uh, you know, that, that wasn't enough uh, of a thrill for you so that you wanted to get into the pest business so that you can go face to face with a uh, with an insect or, or something. What, what's what's the craziest, craziest thing that you've uh, you've come eye to eye with to uh, during your time in this industry? Ironically, the craziest thing was my first uh, in the field job. Um, I, my, my day one in the field working for this brand new company. Um, they took us on a really bad roach infestation. And I'm going to be dating my age. I'm going to be dating my age right now. This was before cell phones had cameras on it. Um, this is when cell phones were like this big. Um, oh, Zach Morris. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we pull up to this apartment complex and the roaches were meeting us at the sidewalk, literally. <laughs> um, thousands of roaches were meeting us at the sidewalk. We walked into the building. Now we had full PPE on, we had a full Tyvek suit, we had full respirator gloves, and we go inside this unit and there are literally hundreds of thousands of roaches. You could not tell what color the carpet was. You couldn't tell what color the walls were. That, that's how many roaches that were there. 
there were roaches on the ceiling that covered the ceiling. And when they couldn't hold on, they fell. And it sounded like it was raining in the apartment because there were so many roaches falling from that floor. And what tugged at my heartstrings was the two residents, one was an elderly woman in her 90s, and she was taking care of an elderly son who had uh, mental disabilities, and her son was in his uh, late 60s. And the son was sitting on the sofa eating a bowl of cereal, and there were, he was covered in roaches. Roaches was on the spoon as he was feeding himself. Um, I started to panic. I started to hyperventilate. I could no longer be in there. There were just so many roaches and I just felt overwhelmed. Um, but I had to maintain my manhood. So I told my boss that I left something in the truck and I was going to go back to the truck to get it. And 20 minutes later, when I didn't return, uh, my boss came back out to the truck and he said, hey, Dennis, we need you inside. What's going on? And I said, I have to be honest with you. I said, I'm having a panic attack. There's no way I can go back in there. And he said, Dennis, listen, uh, we did an assessment on you and this is your calling. This is where you need to be. And I think you'll be a, an excellent technician. And he says, listen, you know, man up, man up and, you know, get yourself back in there. And I guarantee you, you'll never in your lifetime, you'll never come across anything that will be this bad. Um, and I listened to him. I, I, I went back in there. We treated it. We went back weeks later. And to go back inside of that home and to see that elderly woman and to see that her elderly son living without roaches and just see them happy and having a peace of mind, um, I said that. I would never leave pest control because the feeling that I had that day was just unexplicable. I don't even like, I'm not normally one to not say anything as like a response. <laughs> like I literally, that, that's not me. You guys both know me. Like I, I usually have a response, but like I'm just sitting here I, and I've heard this story before. And I like, I guess I just, it, it always boggles my mind. It's just like, you know, to, to think, what does thousands of roaches look like leading into this place? What does right. hundreds of thousands of roaches look like? What does what does <laughs> bugs from the ceiling look like? What does like scarfing down some Ezekiel Elliott, like um, some food in there? Like, you're a Cowboys fan, Dennis? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah, uh, so, like I said, like it's almost like a bad movie. Like it, it like it right. seems like. I'm literally speechless. So congratulations on making Zach Miller speechless. Like it just like, how does that happen? So it ne never before has it been never since it's been that bad. Never, never even close. I mean, I was actually thankful that my boss brought us on that run. Um, it, it's an image that's burned in my brain. I will never forget that day. That day is definitely be, uh, memorable for me. Um, roaches aren't supposed to live in the freezer. And their freezer was infested with live roaches. There were so many roaches, they generated body heat. We brought out of that house, uh, once we finished, I mean, there were almost 12 large contractor side garbage bags full of roaches. <laughs> so I wanted us all to be on the screen so people could see the reaction. Because <laughs> I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, like I mean, look. It, that's like hazmat suit style stuff that you like. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. Like, like, because it's an apartment, so the complex would be the one that would be servicing. Like, it just it seems so ridiculous. Like, I know you lived through it, but like to think of like even one bag of that, to think of like yeah. even a roach in the freezer seems to be like a little unbelievable, I guess, because that that can't happen. And then to have twelve bags of that crap, like. Yeah. Wow, good yeah. on you, uh, Dennis. And that's not even the craziest story that we're going to talk about today. Yes. Yeah, yes, I mean, yeah. and I don't know if you guys saw any of the stories uh, in like New York City where the rats right now are in starvation mode. Um, Aren't they normally like that big too? Yeah. Yeah, and they're now uh, on the hunt for food because people are uh, all quarantined. And uh, I don't know, you have any, any expertise or advice on that, uh, Dennis, that we need to be aware of <laughs> feed the rats <laughs> i've actually been following that new york story for quite a while they've had a, a rat issue long before covid 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, the mayor's trying to figure things out. They brought in different uh, organizations to try to help with rats. Um, I know there's one company that they did contract and they're they're having a lot of success with rats out in the, at least in the Manhattan area. They're setting up these uh, rat uh, uh, bait stations similar to uh, trash cans, the metal trash cans that are locked inside of uh, an area. And these sanitation guys, they unlock the metal cage and they take the crap chat, uh, trash can out. Um, this company has something similar uh, in New York City where they have these metal cages with rat trap boxes inside. And they're sending their technicians out weekly just to unlock the box and you know take out dead rats. And they're having a lot of success, but I, I think their success has been thwarted with uh, COVID. Like you said, Tim, um, you know, people are quarantined. And so the food sources is, is uh, diminished and, you know, that's sending the rat population scurrying for, for food. <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> this is exciting. Uh, so every year is different for pests. And pests in your world is is a plethora of different things, from rodents to insects to a, a couple of other things too. Um, is there? Have you seen that this year? Because more people are at home, it's worse, better. What's this year looking like from a, an actual like in home pest kind of ordeal? Um, it's a good year for us, obviously, uh, but yeah, it's it's a little worse, you know. Not just because people are home longer um, and they're noticing things. But, you know, the kids are not at school. So if you have even two kids or three kids and especially if they're young kids and they're eating in their room and they drop some crumbs, um, the kids are not going to look to pick those crumbs up. Those crumbs are going to stay where they are. And, you know, pests are very good at finding food sources. So even if homeowners don't have pests inside of their home and you have a couple of little ones who drop food, typically within 45 minutes to an hour or sometimes a little bit longer, those outside pests are going to find that potato chip or they're going to find that piece of cake um, that's left on the floor behind the daughter or son's bed. Fascinating. I want to go back to your, your numbers. You're saying that by not going inside the home, uh, that shortened the duration that the techs had to, uh, that, that they needed in order to do their visits. So how do you, how do you uh, move forward with that? Do you, were you able to successfully bring on additional uh, customers or, you know, what, or how, you know, how, talk more about that. How, you know, your numbers and not necessarily the specifics about your numbers, but um, you know, how, how that's affected your business. Sure. Uh so last quarter, of, uh, actually the last quarter of 2019, um, I was talking with one of my mentors and we were looking at ways to scale the business and increase revenue. So one of the ways was to see if we could free up time and have the technician get through more customers in a shorter period, in, in a you know, short period of time. Um, and one way to do that was the exterior service. Like I said, it cut the service time down in half. Um, and as long as we could compact the service area, um, then we were, in some cases, able to double what that technician was able to service within a day. So our average technician will service between eight and 10 stops per day. And by shortening that service time, we were able to increase the eight to 10 stops, um, in some cases, between 16 and 18 stops per day, um, which obviously would double revenue for that day on that service route. And so in that case to someone, you, you do it the outside way. And if someone has additional things, then they come in if they, if, if that doesn't work, is that how that? Sure, absolutely. Works? Yeah. It's not yes. that you completely removed it. It's that you, you guys have found that, um, the outside stuff majority of the time, 80%, I think is the number you gave us, uh, gets the job done. So then, so I'm interested from a communication standpoint, how do you then relay that message to someone who has historically, COVID or not, historically has wanted you to go in their house and spray everything down because that's the way that they think hmm, the cookie crumbles, if you will, right? And now you're saying, eh, it's okay, we can do it outside and, and have just as good of results. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you relate that? How do you communicate that with your customer base? so that they feel comfortable. 
Absolutely. And you hit the, the nail on the head. You know, the thing is about communication. Um, now, one thing I did learn is it is hard to treat an old, uh, teach an old dog new tricks. So a lot of the older customers, the elderly customers, this is how pest control has been done in their life for 70, 80, and in some cases, 90 years. Um, that's going to be a challenge. You know, a lot of them, we're not going to change. We're going to have to come inside and service the inside of those homes because that's how it's always been done. Um, but a lot of our millennial clients, you know, are used to innovation. They're used to technology. They're used to things changing. So they jumped on board right away. You know, I don't have to take a day off from work and come home and let the, the pest control technician inside. He can do it from the outside. Fantastic. You know, send me an, a text message when you're there. Send me a text message saying that the service is complete, you know, right on. Um, and let's let's keep it rocking and rolling. And we noticed that we've had a lot of buy-in, particularly with our millennial clients and even some of our uh, clients that are slightly older than millennial age, that was a big thing for them. You cannot get back time. Time is one of those commodities that is very priceless. So when they don't have to take time away from work, when they don't have to take time away from spending time with the family and they can still have their, meet, their need met, you know, fantastic for them. Um, but again, the elderly clients, you know, we, we spent more energy trying to convince them to change than it would just to be to go inside and do the service. Seems like you have so much figured out. You know your numbers, which is huge. And so many businesses, they struggle because they don't know their numbers. You know, the communication is a big piece and uh, you're, you're moving forward with that. How do you stay current? How do you continue to educate yourself um, with your business? Well, for me, it's all about technology. It's about technology and it's about surrounding yourself with the best of the best. Hey, I'm a smart guy, um, but I know I don't know everything and there's a lot that I don't know. Um, and when I decided to jump into this industry wholeheartedly, I wanted to surround myself with the best of the best. And, you know, you have to have some sort of courage. You know, I reached out to the top people in our industry across the globe and believe it or not, you know, these people want to talk. They want someone to listen to them. They want someone to hear their accomplishments. And hey, I, I get it. You know, I'll massage your ego just so I can be your friend. And if I have uh, questions or concerns or I need help with something, I can reach out to you. And right now on, on Speed Dial, I have 10 of the top uh, pest control entomologists and pest control people across the nation um, that I can actually pick up the phone, just talk to, just to have a conversation. And if I find myself in situations where I really need help, I can pick up my pick up the phone and I can actually get help with some of the best minds in my industry. You have one of the craziest entrepreneurial stories that I've ever heard. Maybe this one will keep me speechless, too, you know, <laughs> even though I've heard it before. But you you've been homeless before. You've you've lived in the office before. You've gotten through it and and you were able to. Um, to, to not be homeless anymore, among other things. Like, can you walk me through that whole process? You know, I know it wasn't necessarily recently, but owning a business and being homeless, you know, I don't think that's something that anyone ever wants to have happen for you to push through and, and, and to not to not let that get to you, I, I think is a huge, a huge showing of grit. And so walk me through how that whole process went down. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I found myself, you know, working in the pest control industry, um, very new. <laughs> Um, at that time, I don't think we were in business six months, nine months, something to that effect. And at the same time, I was in a very tumultuous uh, marriage and it, it was, you know, going downhill with uh, gasoline and fire on it. Um, and it was a situation where I have had to leave the house. I had to leave that toxic environment. Um, and I didn't have a lot of finances. I, I wasn't in a position to get my own apartment. Um, my office at that time was a six by nine uh, office, so probably about the size of a cell. Um, and then we had a desk, a, a chair and uh, two file cabinets. Um, and I, I said, hey, listen, you know, this is a dream. This is something that I want. My why was too big. Um, so I, I didn't want to give up at that point in time. And I dug in, you know, I dug in. Um, and we just, you know, worked very long hours. So it was getting up at 530 in the morning. 
um, to go down the hall and uh, take a bird bath, if you will, shower and shave and kind of get back in my office uh, dressed before the rest of the uh, tenants in that building came in. And, and for over a year, um, none of the tenants knew that I was actually living there. They just thought that, hey, this is a very dedicated person because he's in the office every day at you know 6, 6.30. He's the first one here and he's always the last one to leave. This guy works 24-7. Um, but unbeknownst to them, I was actually living in that space. And within a year, we, we developed enough business um, where I was uh, fortunate enough to, ably, uh, to be able to move out of that uh, office and get my own place. Wow. No, I, I, another fascinating story. So what, uh, what's, what's the biggest thing that you learned from that? I mean, what, was it just to, that to maintain that grit and uh, tenacity to keep on pushing forward? Absolutely. I, you know, any, any challenging situation you find yourself in, you know, there has to be a winner and loser. So had I given up, then, you know, my ex would have won. She would have gotten to me. She would have convinced me that I, I couldn't do it. Um, and I would be working a, a nine to five and, and, and wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today. But my why, the reasons why I was doing it was larger than the troubles I was actually in. And I, ha I just had to focus on the why um, every day. And I knew that I couldn't give up on my why. And as long as that why was important to me, um, then I would have to push forward each and every day to make, make it happen. So I don't think that we've talked about this specific topic on this show in any of the previous, what, 14 episodes or so, Tim? Yeah, I think this is uh, 15, I believe. Number 15. There you go. Is that Ezekiel Elliott's number, 15? Or is he 25? <laughs> what is his number, Dennis? I know, I know you're a huge Cowboys fan, but um, I don't think we've talked about this topic, but it, you just brought it up, so I'm going to. So spouses and business. Uh, you, were, you, were, you were married at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you, as a business owner, decide what to communicate with the spouse how do you decide like, hey, this is my dream, not our dream type of thing? How do you push through something like that where I think it's, it, it is a marriage, obviously, as, as you know, the traditional marriage, but then it's a marriage of, of, of business. And so how do, you, how do you have those conversations or how do you decide like, no, like I'm going to do this because this is what I want and not the significant other side of it? Because I think that's something that is is not talked a lot about. And clearly it's it's something that a lot of us have gone through and many people will continue to go through. So walk me through that. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're married and you're in a good marriage, I think to have that buy-in with your spouse, there's probably nothing like it. Um, the more people you can have on your team, the more people you can have on your side, the better. Um, and those situations, I've noticed other business uh, owners that do have buy-in with their spouse and they do share a lot of the business with their spouse, um, you know, you have two is better than one. So you have someone that's helping you and they can help drive and push you and help grow the business in a multitude of ways. Um, when you don't have that buy-in, you know, that's OK, too. That, that that works as well. And I would in that particular case, I wouldn't share the business side of it, but I would share the dream part of it and just get the backing and the support of your spouse to kind of encourage you in your dream. Um, in my situation, I was just dealing with uh, someone that was a, a thousand percent negative um, and it was toxic. It wasn't just negative. It was a toxic environment. Um, and in that particular case, I chose uh, sanity, I, I chose positivity, and I chose the business uh, versus being a toxic uh, environment. So even if I wasn't in business, the toxicity would have still been there and I would have had to eliminate that toxicity from my life regardless. Well done. Is that hold true? Yeah. Is that hold true with your employees as well in terms of what you tell them and what you don't? Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the great things about being in this, in this position is you really you, we get to pick and choose who we work with. <laughs> you know, what better environment to be in? Um, you know, if you have someone that's toxic, you have someone that's not adding to your life or adding to your business, 
you know, as a, a business owner or a person in that position, you let that person go. You, you hire a person that's going to complement the business and complement you and, and complement the clients. And then you get to build a team of people that you like and a, a team of people that like you. What better environment to have every day is to come in and everyone likes each other. Um, and then you can start the day in a positive environment in a positive way, um, especially when you're hiring on your core values. If you're hiring on core values, um, then you can build a team of people that are like minded. And what better environment to have? Remove the cancer is what I think when I hear that, right? Yeah. Remove the cancer. I think uh, our entire lives we're told, you know, play nice with Johnny. Let Sally be this person, you know, play nice. It's just like, or, or uh, there's one where it's like, uh, keep your enemies closer. I just like, the <laughs> thoughts to me are so ridiculous to me. It's like, why would I surround myself with things that bring me pain, that do not bring me joy, that, that bring toxicity to my life? That's already, you know, less than 120 years probably you know is, is what it seems like is how long we live less than 120 years and that's probably 10 extra than necessary but why like i love that you said that because i think it's just it's it's incredibly potent and and um remove the cancer is is what i gather from that so so good on you for that you used the term why a lot you know that was my why i think a lot of people say you know what is their why type of thing like well, is that something that like you you learned or you just recognize like what's the whole why concept to you because i think it is a little different to everyone right so you know a lot of people that go into business um you have to have a a, a passion you have to have something that's going to drive you and money is not a motivator even though people think money is a motivator um there has to be something deeper that there has to be a connection that connects you to that business because not every day is going to be roses. There's going to be a lot of days that everyone tells you no, and you're going to feel like giving up and you're going to feel like quitting. What's going to keep you going when everyone's telling you no? And then if that day turns into two days and that two days turns into a week and that week turns into a month and that month turns into six months and you have six months of no's, what's going to keep you driving? Um, I recently had uh, a, a new baby. So my baby's five months old. So my why has changed from me being 25 years old um, and now me being of a different age, um, being as though I have a five month old, my why has changed to her. So I have to build a legacy for her. I have to build a uh, home environment for her so that when she gets older, she doesn't have to go through some of the struggles that I may have gone through um, and, and, and kind of difficult to, to say, but my, again, my why has changed and my why now is for her. So I can quit on myself, um, you know, if things get tough, I can quit on myself if things get hard, but how can you quit on a five month old? You can't. So every day that you come in, no matter hard, how hard it gets, you're going to push through because you know, you're not doing it for yourself. In my case, I'm doing it for my five month old. No, I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the things that I always uh, tell folks or um, warn people that if your why is about money, then you need to find a new why. Because like you said, as soon as you hit that first skid where things get really bleak and you don't know what the uh, what your future is going to look for, then the, the first opportunity, the next opportunity you have that could offer you a financial gain a lot of times people will drop what they're doing now for the next opportunity so you definitely need to to focus on that why and make sure that it's uh you know making money is not a bad thing but that can't be what you're completely what uh, what what other advice do you give to someone right now that wants to start a business do you think it's would you start a business right now or uh you know what, what advice would you tell someone that, that said dennis I'm, I'm thinking about starting a business what advice do you have for me uh, but normally I would say, make sure that it's something that you have a passion for. Make sure it's something that you know. Um, I don't know how many times I hear people going into business and I say, well, what do you know about that business or what do you know about that industry? Uh, I know it makes a lot of money. I, I don't know anything else about it, but it makes a lot of money. Um, 
it'll save you a lot of pain and heartache if you know that business inside and out and you have a passion for it. You know, the old saying for me is true. If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I don't work when I come to work. I love what I do. It's a passion for me to eliminate pests from people's businesses and homes because I get that joy feeling when I know that I'm giving them back a, a, a quality of life that they were used to. Um, so for me, uh, it's this is the right industry for me. I have a passion for it. I've learned the business. I've worked for another company. I've learned it inside and out. Um, and the pitfalls are going to be less and less because I have some education in this space. If I joined the business that I had no education in that space and I just got in because uh, they made a lot of money, um, eventually I'd probably have to shut my doors because I don't know anything about that industry. So my advice would be learn the industry before you jump in and then make sure it's a passion. Make sure you have a passion for it, something that's going to drive you day to day. You have bright, well, I'm colorblind, so hopefully this is correct. Uh, you have bright yellow. I think it's yellow. Is it yellow? It's yellow. People tell me. I, literally, my old office had green carpet. When I learned that, like six months left before I got rid of it, I thought it was gray the entire time. No joke. You, you've been there, right? So like, yeah. you've been there too, obviously, like I thought that was gray carpet. It was green, apparently. I had no <laughs> idea. So um, you have a very bright color palette in your branding you have a logo that's very unique you guys drive around you're, you're you have a fleet vehicle that you drive around that's very well branded and stuff like that walk me through having all of that resonate with a fan or to a potential um customer so that it stands out where you know not everyone does that um, with their cars. They just kind of are boring and stuff where you have really said, you know what, Let, let's be bold. Let's be, let's be ridiculous. Like what was the, the reasoning behind that? Um, and you'll like this one. Uh, we want it to be the anomaly. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Um, of course so we, I love that. <laughs> we want it to be the anomaly. Like you said, a lot of the companies, white truck, blue font, black font, um, and there's nothing different about them. They look like every other company on the road. When you see our vehicles, you know it's the Test Control Company Accurate Test Solutions. You could not be a brighter yellow um, on our vehicles. Our technicians are in yellow shirts. Uh, uh, all of our vehicles are very, very bright yellow wrapped with this gorgeous logo here. Um, and we did this so that we would be recognizable. If we are at Zach Miller's house and we're servicing his house, we wanted the person down the street to know that we were a test control company. They didn't have to walk down to Zach Miller's house because it was so bright yellow, it was going to catch their attention. Um, and I gave someone the example one time, and I said, uh, meet me at uh, MacArthur Mall. And he's like, okay, what time are you going to be there and what are you going to be driving? I said, you'll know me when I'm there. I said, meet me at MacArthur Mall. Um, and we went to MacArthur Mall and I was sitting in my vehicle and he pulls up right on the side of me. There must have been 2,000 or more cars out there. And I didn't tell him where I was located and he found me in seven minutes. Um, that would have never happened if I was in a white vehicle with blue font. I guess so many people are just terrified to um, to be seen when like, obviously I wrote a book on it called How to Stand from the Crowd. But like, I feel like so many people just like, you're, you're gonna get a fleet of vehicles anyway. It probably literally costs you nothing different to do what you've done, but you've done something that is unique that will get someone's attention. I think the only thing that you could have done from a fleet perspective that would have been even more ridiculous is to actually have some sort of like insect on the top of it or something like popping out, like something like that. But like. I don't understand why people get so boring. Now, I maybe I used to work at Domino's as like a high schooler, and I guess they would get um, um, egged a lot by people. So maybe that's the reason why. But I don't know. Like to to me, it's it, it seems like it's something that was very cognizant from your standpoint, and it's made sense. And I think more people should do something bold so that they can be recognized when something like this 
um, when, when you have an opportunity to do something like this, especially driving around in a vehicle 24 seven around, you know, the entire region, which is a crap ton of area. Now, like they said, you know, you don't have to go to Zach and say, who did your pest stuff? It's no, it's right there. It's, it's accurate. A absolutely. Absolutely. And we were very strategic about that. And it's, it's a one-time investment in marketing and it pays off continuously. Um, and today was no different. I mean, I'm coming into the office today and literally a client, um, a client that I actually, I actually took the notes this morning. She called in this morning and she's asking about pest service. And I said, well, how did you hear about us? And she said, well, I saw this bright yellow vehicle driving down the road and I, I pulled the driver over um, so I could get the contact information. Um, she would have never noticed that driver in a white vehicle with blue fine. I'm going to tell you this yellow vehicle with the bug on it, it draws the attention. And almost daily, we get at least one or two calls that come in and it's from people that saw that bright yellow vehicle on the road. But again, it's, it's not even like you said, it's a one-time investment. Yeah. Well, it's a one-time investment that you were going to invest in anyway. Right. So it caught it like it, there, there was no additional money spent on something. You knew that you were going to have a fleet of vehicles that were tagged. So you tagged them and you weren't boring with it. So kudos to you. <laughs> Minus that's, the Dallas Cowboys side of it. That's because I read the book Anomaly. It wasn't raining before you did that, but, but thanks. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, what do you think? I think that uh, it's, I, I love hearing, I mean, you have 18 years of, uh, of learning. And um, the thing that is uh, that I appreciate so much about having you on today and, and learning from you is that you've always found a way. Uh, it, it's not a matter of why we can't do something. It's, oh, it's, it's what can we do in order to, to keep pushing the ball forward. And uh, so, I mean, again, so many people that, uh, that I talk to throughout the course of a day, it's uh, they need this before they can get that, or I need a, a business loan in order to get started. And uh, you've just proven everybody wrong that, you know, if you have a strong why, you'll find a way. And uh, that that's really, really inspiring. And you can see the passion just pouring out of you when it comes to your business. So uh, it's very inspiring for those that are watching. And I hope that, that people, they get that and uh, they share that and, and they take that on for themselves just to start their business. So that's awesome. Yeah, it, just to kind of echo uh, that sentiment. I mean, that's where solutions is in our name. Um, we're not here necessarily to control, we're here to provide solutions. So um, in business and in pest control, we won't take no for an answer. I mean, I don't know how many calls we've gone on where they said, hey, we had Terminex, we had Orkin, or we had this other company, and they said that we'd have to live with this pest. There's no way you can get rid of that pest. And I call shenanigans to that. Um, it takes some thought process. You have to investigate. You know, we have to figure out why that pest is there. And we would never tell a, a customer that we're just going to control. Um, we may need some help from that customer. It may be some environmental issues on their part that they have to help with, but we can eliminate that pest. It's just going to be a little bit more work. And in just as, as in business, um, to me, there was only one option and the only option was success. Uh, the the uh, giving up was not an option. So when your only option is success, then you have to find solutions to every problem that comes up. You, you're a big fan of vacations. I think the number is you try to take a few. You try to take a few a year, three or four, once every quarter. If you hit a specific goal, is that something that you're still doing since you've had the kid? And obviously, COVID's going on, so we all can't go to you know to the Bahamas or Bermuda or wherever, and and you know to wherever in the world, Europe, et cetera. But like, is, is vacation still something that you think is very important for a business owner to take? I, I do. And unfortunately, you know, COVID has put a halt to that. I was just having that conversation with my fiance. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't gone anywhere in 2020. Um, but uh, last year and every year uh, previous to that, as Zach, you said, we do four vacations a year. We do one a quarter um, and then we do some mini vacations throughout the year as well. And I think self-care is everything, you know, 
as you know, business people, there's a lot that we are dealt. There's a lot of stress. Um, and you have to create ways to unwind. You have to create ways to kind of reset. Um, you can't always be on go because, you know, burnout is a real thing. And, you know, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to come from back from burnout. So to prevent that and to eliminate that, um, we have our reset days, which is, you know, typically our quarterly uh, vacations. And is that something that uh, you encourage all of your uh your staff to, to take advantage of, to not necessarily quarterly vacations unless unless you're paying for them. Maybe I'll uh, <laughs> drop my application and work for you, Dennis. But is that something that you, uh, that's, do you have that work-life balance with your staff? I, I do. Um, in fact, I have, I have one uh, technician who prides himself on never having time off. So I have to, I have to physically make this young man take off. Um, he, he worked for me for years and he would, he didn't want to take vacation. Um, but he, you know, he gets two weeks a year. And when that time comes, if he hasn't chosen a day, then I choose for him. And I tell him, I do not want to see you for these two weeks. You're on vacation, um, go somewhere, relax, enjoy and reset. And as good of an, as an employee as he is, you know, burnout is real. And I realize if he doesn't get that two weeks to reset, if he doesn't get that two weeks to kind of unwind, I realize that, you know, we would be doing him an injustice and a disservice because eventually he would burn out. Um, but when he takes that vacation and he comes back and he resets, um, I can tell that his battery's on full charge and he's ready to go again. Um, he's just an awesome guy. I mean, this is a guy that comes to work. Uh, I think last year he actually came to work with pneumonia. Um, and I could see it in his face. I'm like, man, you're three seconds away from dying. What are you doing here? He's like, I got pneumonia, but you know, I don't want to take a day off. I want to work. And I'm like, no, you go home right now. I don't want to see you for a week. <laughs> you, you, you have some wild stories, Dennis. I mean, <laughs> you got to stop watching all them like Dateline shows or whatever. I don't <laughs> um, so when we're talking about business, when you started, did you did you raise money? Did you take money out? Did you have personal money? Did you put it on credit cards? Because I think, you know, Tim was saying, you know, there's so many people there say, I can't start this business until I have X. And X is typically money that someone else is going to give me. When you start Accurate, what was the money situation like? How did you get started? And, and I've heard those same things. I've heard, you know, it takes money to make money. You have to have this amount uh, to start. Um, and again, I call shenanigans, you know, there's all, well, there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I worked at FedEx for many years. I had built up a, a small retirement. Um, and I, I drew from that, I think it was less than $5,000. And from that $5,000, we got, you know, we got a vehicle, we had some basic equipment. Um, and that was it. You know, it was it was pretty much done on a shoestring. And, and that's when, you know, guerrilla marketing was it was all we knew. And it was going out door to door, banging on doors and acquiring customers. And we just weren't going to stop. We were going to keep knocking on doors until we reached the number that we wanted to reach. Um, not we weren't looking for a certain amount of no's. We were looking to knock on do doors until we hit the number that we wanted to hit. And however long it took is however long it took. How do you differentiate yourself from the Terminexes and uh, the other big box brands out there? The, the key thing is uh, our, our customer service. Um, the, the big box brands, you know, they have a board of directors and they have they're on the, the stock market and they have to make that board happy. And the only way to make that board happy is to show them numbers. And those numbers have to look good um, for us. We build our numbers by building relationships with our customers. So we're going to send out the same technician. In a lot of cases, the big box brand, they send the technician that's close in the area. We're going to send the same technician. That technician is going to learn that person's home. They're going to learn that person's family. Um, we have some technicians that's been on the route uh, seven years, eight years. They know when the children's birthday is coming up. They know when the anniversary of the homeowners are. Um, they know that they're going to get ants before they have ants. They know that this is the season when mice are coming. So let me put this out and be proactive for mice. Um, if you have a new technician every single time you have service, 
um, there's no way that they're going to learn that property. Each technician that comes, they're learning from scratch. And we get a lot of lot of customers that come from big box uh, companies, and the biggest issue they have is every single time they have service, it's a different technician. Yeah, um, tell that story over and over again. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the biggest things uh, that differentiates us from the big box brands. With that being said, I think obviously there's a huge push for buy local and 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 and, and buying small businesses and stuff like that. Oftentimes, I think it can be hard though to buy local and to buy and support small businesses um, because of pricing, because of ability to um, uh, schedule quickly. You know, these big boxes typically have a lot more options where a small business doesn't. So if someone was, you know, on the fence about buying local or, or not kind of in that whole like concept of, you might not have as many options. What would you say to someone who was, let me use this word again, combating, you know, the, the, the buy local movement, because I think even now it's, it's more important than ever with COVID in, 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 in people's minds and in people's worlds. So how does someone support small business when it's not, maybe not as easy or convenient to support as it is, you know, a big box. Right. So luckily now we're at a stage where we can compete in that space, at least locally. Um, and we can get a technician out within 24 hours. We can um, meet certain uh, uh, demographic areas and service those areas. However, there are going to be some challenges. Yes. You know, a Terminex may say, hey, we can get someone there in an hour where we may say we can't get someone there in an hour, but we can get someone there in four hours. Um, and, and pricing wise, you know, there may be some cases where for certain services or certain devices that we sell, because we don't have that buying power, we may be 15 percent or 20 percent uh, more than a Terminex um, or an Orkin where they have the buying power, let's say, for a dehumidifier or fans. And they purchase so many that they can undercut us about 15 or 20 percent. The difference comes in the service servicing of that uh, that device. And also, again, some uh, fluctuation and flexibility with the service. So if you do have a service with a big box brand, um, because of their processes and procedures, they're going to say you're going to get A, B and C with that service. And that's it. Um, we may offer A, B and C, but there may be a little bit of flexibility where we can add some additional uh, services in there for you, because, again, we're not bound by our, our board of directors and we're not on the stock market and, and that sort of thing. So we don't have to make anyone happy, but our clients, where a lot of these big box brands, you know, the first person they have to make happy is the board member. The second person they make happy is the client. Appreciate that. Yep. What's something that we haven't talked about today, Dennis, that you love to talk about? Uh, your beard. Mine or Tim? Because I think Tim's is pretty. Tim has been growing his beard out. I mean, yeah. But you, you, you cut yours in half. You. Uh... I just saw a picture of myself, like one of these videos popped up recently, and I was like, "Damn, that thing really got long." <laughs> yeah, that's the funny thing about doing this show every week is that uh, we can look through each show week by week to see the the beard progression or the the COVID uh, hair progression. It's just warm outside and uh, I didn't want to do it anymore. I was like, you know, I'm outside. I got a, my, my Ironman race hasn't been canceled yet. So it's the, it's literally, I think the only race now that hasn't been canceled in Ironman's um, calendar in America. And who knows if it will, like, I don't, I'm, last thing I want is to get there and be like, uh, I'm not trained well. So, I mean, look, you just, keep doing the work that's right <laughs> every day good luck with that iron man as well thanks <laughs> I, I would be starting off as a styrofoam man maybe if there was a <laughs> <laughs> i 
don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but it sounds fun. And, I, you know what? If, if you wanted to sign up for the Styrofoam Man race, I would do it with you right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak for Tim here and say that he would, too. Styrofoam Man. Maybe I'll start that. <laughs> Maybe I'll see if I can buy styrofoamman.com. And uh, it's... I don't know what it is, but we could figure out something. We, we can come up with something, yeah. What, what's your favorite activity to do physically? How, let me so rephrase. In, in yeah. Ironman, how many miles are you running with an Ironman? Uh, so there's two Ironman races. So they have a, a 70.3, which is the one I'm doing, and that is 1.2-mile swim, 56-mile bike, and a 13.1-mile run, all back-to-back-to-back to back to back in the same day. Uh, okay. An Ironman 140.6, the full, is double that. Okay. So the styrofoam would be just running 0.3 miles. <laughs> it, it'll be swimming 0.2 miles. And it'll be it'll be biking 0.1 mile. 0.1 uh, yeah. mile bike. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> Dennis's, uh, Dennis's activity right now is, is chasing his daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Enjoy that. Well, Dennis, appreciate you being with us today. If you guys are interested in learning more about Dennis, make sure to go to the website, accuratepets.com. Schedule a, a service with, with Dennis, and he can show you all the things that he just talked about over the last few minutes. Tim, it's always fun catching up with you. Until next time, we'll see you guys. That's peace and pancakes because I love to eat pancakes without roaches on them. So i um, glad you were able to help that family that one time, Dennis. And um, we'll see you guys next week. Take care, guys. Peace.